Uh, and a very, very simple example shows how you could be a very different sort of person if you didn't reflect on why you choose to do what you do and why you think as you do about the world, and somebody who doesn't. Supposing, for example, you um, had got wet every time you went into the rain without an umbrella, but you'd read Hume, David Hume, who said, well, David Hume didn't bring up the chicken example, it was Russell who did, but, he, but Russell, remember, reminded us of the chicken who got fed every day, and kept safe from foxes and so on, and began to think that life's pretty good until the day he got his neck wrung. So what this is meant to illustrate is that inductive inference is unreliable. Things can go badly wrong all of a sudden. Well, so Hume was always saying that the fact that the sun had risen every day in the past doesn't entail that it will tomorrow. So you can't um, uh, you know, uh, conclude 100% that the future will resemble the past because that belief is just itself inductive. Well, so you think this, and you think to yourself, well, that means that the next time I go in the rain without an umbrella, I might not get wet on good human principles. So it rains and you don't take an umbrella and you venture forth. But what would your neighbors say? They would say, among other things, that you're irrational, that you haven't proportioned the evidence, which is what all the inductive past provided you, with the judgment that you make and the action that you take. And that therefore, by the lights of the uh, observer of um, uh, how ethically you are behaving as regards rationality, that you have been rationally unethical, that you've failed an obligation of the ethics of rationality there. And you failed because you've been insufficiently reflective. This is the, the way in which uh, the ethics of rationality tie into the more general thing. And Socrates says the good life, the best life, is the considered life, meaning the reflective, the thought about life. Then it will be a life in which thinking about things being skeptical in the right positive kind of way, proportioning judgments to evidence, will feed into your thinking about the world, about the universe, about the nature of things independently of, of human beings, as well as about human experience. And so it would seem to follow that if you were genuinely reflective and genuinely mindful of your intellectual obligations, that you would be an atheist. So that's a much stronger claim than we're quite used to, to making about this matter. And I leave it hanging in the air. Maybe we can append to the Copenhagen Declaration that uh, uh, you're a very, very naughty person if you're not an atheist. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so the other point now is, is the point about uh, ethics in the more familiar sense, the ethics, uh, ethics understood as um, relating to what kind of people we are, how we live our lives, what values we choose, and how we pursue them. And um, here, I think, something very important uh, comes out of the idea that if, you, if, you, if your starting point is not that there is some tradition of thought about these things which you are under an obligation to accept. Now, this is, this is something that uh, a person brought up in a religious household, a Muslim or a, an evangelical household or an Orthodox Jewish household, would naturally think. Now, having been brought up in, in that tradition, they would have been coached into thinking that there is a right way to live and a right way to think and a seriously wrong way to do all those things or lots of seriously wrong ways to do those things. But if, if you are, are persuaded that um, it is your responsibility to think about things, that you can't inherit um, a, a divine command uh, set of prescriptions which tell you how you must live, but that it's up to you to do it, your next step is to uh, re reflect on what you have to offer your own good life. This is an interesting point, this, because we tend to forget that uh, all our traditions, all our religious traditions, and some of the political traditions which have been very influential in the last 100 years or more, like Nazism and Stalinism as very good examples, have been top-down traditions. That is, the, 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 the priests or the, or the um, uh, vanguard cadres or whoever know, the, know what the answer is. They, they own the truth, and they are imposing it on everybody, and everybody has to sign up for it uh, at pain of penalty. That if you don't believe or if you don't accept or if you don't submit yourself to the revolution or whatever it might be, then you're, you're in trouble. So everybody's got to be marshaled into a uniform uh, one-step, uh, lockstep uh, progress towards the realization of the one great truth that the masters, whoever they might be, whether pope or, or top commissar, tells us is the right thing. 
And the whole point of the Enlightenment project from the 17th and 18th century onwards was to free people, liberate people from this top-down, one-size-fits-all, one great truth model. And to give people individual autonomy, not merely the individual freedom, but the individual responsibility to think about how they should act and live their lives. Because a, a, a new premise uh, in, in the development of the Enlightenment and its, and its project came into view, which is that human beings are genuinely diverse, that societies have to be very pluralistic to take account of this fact, that individuals have very different talents from one another uh, for making good lives and for living good lives and for forming good relationships, and that this diversity of talents requires individual liberty. It's no surprise to me that um, the idea of, of the rights of the individual and of uh, a dispensation of um, civil liberties and the idea of the rule of law which provides a kind of a framework for adjusting competing and conflicting interests in society where there will be a multiplicity of them. No surprise that all that arose along with the Enlightenment. The idea that the ethical life, the well-lived and flourishing life is an individual responsibility. It's not a response to uh, a one-size-fits-all theory, a religion or something, but it is the responsibility of the individual himself or herself. So in order to, to be able to create such a life for oneself, one does need that margin of, of liberty, of freedom, of space around one to make certain choices for, for oneself, which might be different from other people's choices, and which allows one to experiment and fail and try again and build something which is the life worth living conformable to my talents for living, my interests, my capacities. And then there will be as many good lives as there are good people to live them, providing they all observe what John Stuart Mill came to call the harm principle, that whatever we do mustn't harm other people, recognizing the flaws and failings in human nature that drive people towards greed and cruelty and unkindness and trying to master those facts about us as social animals, but still giving people the autonomy to do that. Now, humanism, with a small h and in the most general sense, is not a set of ethical doctrines. It's not, it doesn't have a Ten Commandments or anything else. Rather, it is, it is a, a mindset a mindset premising itself on this idea of individual autonomy and individual responsibility to build the good uh, conformably to one's individual talents for it. Uh, it's the idea that um, as uh, humans in human society in a human-sized world, uh, we must look for the opportunities and take the responsibilities that lead to the good. And the good will itself be a very diverse and plural thing. There are lots and lots of, of things that are, are good and satisfying for human beings. Um, friendship, uh, enjoyment of nature, uh, creativity, painting, writing, the enjoyment of others, productions in that respect, uh, and learning, and of course, and above all, um, good, satisfying, caring relationships with, with other people. And we will all have very different ways of being able to achieve these things. And it's very interesting to go back and, and to look at uh, how different this way of looking at, at ethics is from how it was in the past. Look at the contrast, for example, between the period in European history when the church was very dominant, the, very, the high point of the power of the church in Europe in the later medieval period, let us say from the 11th to the 13th or 14th century when the official outlook enjoined upon everybody who was a member of the church was to think of this world and this life as a place of danger, of desperation, that you had to hang on in here to get through into the posthumous dispensation. And if you didn't sin too much, if you didn't give too many opportunities to the devil and all his agents to snag your soul and drag it off to hell, if you could just hang on there, deny a lot of things about your human nature or natural impulses and appetites, you might make it. Or you might make it into purgatory and not have to spend too long there. And the literature which pervade this attitude in the medieval period is known to us now as contemptuous mundi literature, uh, contempt of the world, literature which describes the world as a place of, of dirty, 
dangerous, misleading, fleshy appetites, uh, greed and sex and, and uh, desire for drink and all, all the things that are going to lead you astray. And then contrast that to the Renaissance period. Contrast that to paintings of landscapes and picnics and enjoyment of music and the oration on the dignity of man by Pico della Mirandola and portraits of ordinary people. And an immense contrast between the two. And what had been rediscovered in the Renaissance and why people like Petrarch and others called it themselves, gave it the name of Renaissance, was because they had rediscovered the enjoyment, uh, the delight, the pleasure, and the possibilities that the poets and writers and philosophers of classical antiquity and the, and the Hellenic and Roman periods had found in this world during the course of this human life. And they wanted to recover that and celebrate it again, to um, take back into the possession of a human experience in this time that we have between birth and death in this world of something that was good, that a life could be good in it if we were reflective and if we chose it. And that's the kind of idea, that, that ideal is the kind of idea that was fought for for so many centuries, right into the modern, um, more recent contemporary period, allied with all those institutional, political, cultural changes required to free up individuals to seek those things for themselves and for the people they care about in this world during this life now.